into the stretch. Country House on the outside. Code of Honor down toward the rail. Maximum security keeps on fighting. War of Will is there too as they come to the final furlong. It is Country House on the outside. Maximum security so dead game. He keeps battling on. Maximum security. Country House went two down to the line. Maximum security wins the Kentucky Derby. Second, followed by Code of Honor, third, and in behind them, Master Fencer, who was closing late inside of Tacitus. It's maximum security. He's never lost a race, and he wins it under Luis Science. There is an objection that has been posted on the board, so it is unofficial for the moment. There you see the unofficial order of finish. He did come out at the top of the stretch, nearing the top of the stretch. He impeded the one horse war of will. Mm -hmm. Maximum security moved out of lane before he was clear, forcing the rider of number one war of will to check up a little bit. Now, it, at that point, the 20, the runner-up country house, whose claim foul was on the outside yellow cap, it ha actually happened before that. It did not affect number 20. He didn't, he didn't have to steady because of this, but the one horse did have to steady. War of Will. Coming to the top of the stretch, maybe about a sixteenth of a mile before the quarter pole, is where maximum security ducked out. He did bother War of Will, definitely. Yes! They disqualified him. They did. So for the first time in the history of the Kentucky Derby, the horse that crossed the line first has been disqualified. After the objection, Country House wins the Kentucky Derby. The other issue is, and again, something we couldn't ask the stewards, how much did you consider safety as an issue there? I mean, with the year that we've had in horse racing, um, if Tyler Gaffleone and, and War of Will don't stay out, collectively keep that horse upright, if he goes down, at the very least, there's going to be a lot of crazy things happening behind him and a, a, yeah. a very sore jockey and a very sore horse, and at the worst, a catastrophe. Hi once again everybody, I'm Ed Berliner. Welcome to Studio B and this is another edition of The Man in the Arena. The 2019 Kentucky Derby and everybody after the Derby is talking about what happened, the fact that it was an historic race, but lost amidst it all is what Tim Layden was talking about right there at the end when they started to look back at what happened in the Kentucky Derby. The dangerous factor that was involved. Had maximum security fallen? Had a heel been clipped? Had a foot been placed improperly, had the mud slipped, anything could have happened. You could have had several horses and jockeys falling to the track. It could have been an unbelievable disaster. And when he mentioned the year in horse racing, that's what we're here to talk about. Because in one year alone, over 400 thoroughbred horses were put down, were euthanized at tracks. That's not even to say the ones that we don't know about. But thoroughbred racing has become dangerous for not just the jockeys, but for the horses themselves. And there are people now starting to look at this industry. I was involved in the industry for a long time. And even I've been saying, maybe it's time to put the thoroughbred industry out of business. We finally did it with Greyhound Racing, and maybe it's time for the horses as well. We're actually going to speak to somebody today as a guest on the show who is going to look at both sides, and that's going to be part of the interesting factor here. My guest is a veterinarian. Her Veterinarian practice is in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It is the Hillcrest Meadow Equine Center. Uh, she also runs a nonprofit called the Pennsylvania Race, uh, Racehorse Rehoming, Rehabilitation, and Rescue. It's called PAR. And PAR takes a chance and an opportunity to help these horses. They need a little more help because all I have to do is mention two words Santa Anita and what happened there late in 2018. And that's where the discussion basically is involved. It is a pleasure to welcome to the man in the arena, Kate Parr joins us on the show. Dr. Parr, thank you so much for being here. It's Dr. Papp, but that's okay. Parr Doctor. is my rescue. You oh, uh, that mostly right. Dr. Papp, I'm sorry, you're exactly right. <laughs> Dr. Papp, thank you for joining us. You are something of a lightning rod when it comes down to the thoroughbreds. You treat them, you are very careful in them, you, you work with these horses, yet you are also a critic of what has happened in thoroughbred racing over the years. And as I've read a number of articles regarding what you have done, uh, you have become someone that a lot of people say, well, maybe she shouldn't be around the horses. I have one here that talks about in 2014, Penn National tried to give you a five-year ban because of statements you made at the track and on Facebook regarding the death of one of the horses in the paddock. 
So you're not afraid to speak your mind, which is exactly why I wanted to have you on the show here today. Let's start out by, by dealing in some basics here. Is it not fair to say that the thoroughbred industry has become much more dangerous in recent years? And there are so many horses that simply are, are suffering the effects of thoroughbred racing that we need to take a deeper look at what's happening to the industry itself. Uh, the simple answer question to that question is yes. Basically, my husband's a third generation thoroughbred trainer, and we talk about this all the time. How I they used to ride races without helmets. I asked how no, not nearly as many horses and people, jockeys were exercise riders were injured back then, or at least that we heard about compared to what we hear about today. And I really think it comes down to a today's thoroughbred is a different breed almost from the thoroughbred that they raced back then and a lot of the trainers that we have now are not what I would call equal horsemen to the ones that were trainers back then. Let's get to that because as I said I was around the industry for many years as a sportscaster I covered thoroughbred racing I covered the triple crown series for a long time and I can tell you that I was back in the barns I saw some things that made me shudder when I, I looked at what was happening, and I looked at the drugging of horses even back then. And as a matter of fact, I have a graphic here that I want people to look at because I don't think people realize this sometimes. The amount of drugs placed into one horse in one week of injections. We've got several different drugs here, doctor. These are not simply animals being out to run because they want to run. Again, is it not fair to say that these animals are overdrugged, and this is a direct result of greed from those who simply want the animals to win, and they got to make the money back one way or another, so let's jack them up as much as we can. I think the answer to that question is not every trainer and not every owner feels that way, so therefore not every horse is um, raced that way, trained that way, treated that way. But However, many are. A, a majority are. The whole point is that 90% plus 90 percent plus of horses are running on Lasix when we know that not more than 90% of horses actually experience exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage, which is what we're treating for with race day Lasix. And uh, it's been known for a long time to be a performance enhancer, and therefore if someone's using it, everyone's using it, and they don't necessarily need it. When you look at what happened at Santa Anita late in 2018. I believe the final number, and, and again, I'm, I'm just going by memory here, I believe it was 22 or 23 uh, horses that died at the racetrack. And the racetrack continued to say, we don't know what's happening. We're as mystified as you are. Doctor, I got a tough time believing that because to me that's BS. They know what's going on. They have to know what's going on. 20 plus horses dying in one meet? This, when you hear something like that as a veterinarian, what's the first thing that comes to your mind as to a, as to a cause for this? I think based on the research done and the necropsy reviews that I've done, that it comes down to pre-existing injury and covering up pre-existing injuries, training through pre-existing injuries, and bringing the horses past the plateau of where we can expect that a catastrophic injury is more than likely to occur in the near future. Is it fair to say that, and again, we're not talking everybody, because I do want to point out, too, I still have friends in the industry, and there are some, very few I saw in South Florida when I covered the racing circuits here, who really seem to care about their animals, really seem to want to take exceptional care of them, but they didn't win a lot, and I actually had right. one trainer tell me, I don't want my, horse, my horses to die, but I also don't want to go bankrupt. If my horses don't win... I have to put people out of business, and then I have to sell the horses for slaughter. Is it not fair to say that most of these, and again, I'm trying so hard not to put everybody in the same basket, and it's difficult, but this is a, a greed factor. This is a factor of if the horses don't win, and I said this in the last week, right after, even before and after the Derby, social media everywhere I went, Many of these horses, it's not as if they all get put out to stud somewhere. They don't all wind up on beautiful farms in Ocala or Pennsylvania somewhere. Many of them are sold to Asian slaughterhouses, to overseas slaughterhouses. 
And this is the side of the industry we never see. Horses will then enter what's called the knocking chute. They'll go through this passageway here. After each horse enters the chute, this door here will be closed. That way, the horses waiting to be slaughtered will not be spooked by what happens to the horse in here. This is the captive bolt gun. It uses air pressure to shoot a bolt into a horse's skull, knocking them unconscious. Is that not all still there today and maybe even getting worse? Especially at the lower level tracks, I think that happens more frequently. I'm not sure it exactly happens in that order. Um, there are some people that are wealthy owners that will stay in the business and use play money to um, have race horses and do it properly. So just by saying that they're going to, if they don't make money, they're going to go out of business. It depends. A lot of people who get into racing start get it by getting into racing already having money that they're willing to give away just as if they had show horses where you never expect to get money back. However, when you are using racing as a way of making a living and you have to support families and, um, you know, your own needs based on that and your owners as well are expecting to make money and for you to win, then they're at odds with what the welfare of the horse is demanding, which may be time off, uh, expensive veterinary treatment or other such things. And then if they do have to get rid of the horses, disband their stable per se, there are aftercare possibilities now that have expanded in the last uh, few years uh, with the Thoroughbred Aftercare Association and a bunch of other um, aftercare programs that are associated with each racetrack. Um, however, most of them have waiting lists at this point in time. And if the owner, trainer, or connections don't want to hang on to that horse for the few extra days or weeks it takes to get into these programs, then they are res responsible for finding a place for the horse to go. Uh, it is actually against track most track policy rules to send a horse directly to slaughter to a known kill buyer to public auction where kill buyers are known to frequent. However, um, if you go through a bill of sale to your friend, your neighbor, somebody who swears they're going to take a great care of the horse, and then they end up in a public auction being sent to a kill buyer, then that trainer and connections are off the hook. So that does happen. I don't think I've ever heard the phrase kill buyer before, but I think that that absolutely fits it very well when you talk about tracks that have rules and regulations that say this is not what you're allowed to do should we not just be honest here and say that many of these people who are looking to do this they've invested a tremendous amount of money they'll take the write-off it becomes basically a business write-off if you will to take the thousands of dollars that they have on the horse and just junk him, junk her, and they will do whatever they can to basically toss them on a slaughterhouse and get rid of them. I, I just, I, I can't imagine that there's a preponderance of people in the industry that are willing to go to the, the extra level and care for their horses that much, when in many ways, they're simply nothing more than meat on a hoof. They're nothing more than a commodity that can be written off, and you can take the loss, walk away, and who cares? They really don't care about the animals. That is definitely the case. I mean, I've seen that in the case of many owners and many trainers, um, many owner trainers who are the same. And unfortunately, there there are absolutely reasons why they won't invest in that horse and that horse's care, time, and long-term benefit. However, they can, if rather than sending to slaughter auction, I mean, we do have options for humane euthanasia. I'm not saying that that's something that I would recommend for a three-year-old, four-year-old horse who can have a happy rest of their 20 years with some time off. However, it's still a better option than um, sending off to slaughter. So when you're saying, you know, they're done with the horse, they can't make any more money, uh, there are options, even if it's not to continue to own that particular horse. The other thing that I see people do is once they realize they have a problem with a certain horse and want to get rid of it, as you say, they will um, medicate it heavily, run it in a cheaper claiming race and hope that it gets uh, bought by somebody else. And then it becomes that other person's problem. Just off the top of your head, and again, I, I haven't seen any real numbers on this, but I guess from you then, out of 100% of the horses that race at thoroughbred tracks across America, what's the percentage you would guess that wind up 
three, four, five years of age, and you said they live 20 plus, but wind up being used for slaughter or meat or basically being executed when they simply have plenty of life left in them? They've shown to be the, basically the average thoroughbred full crop per year is about the same number that end up um, going across the border to Mexico or Canada for slaughter um, each year. So basically the full crop, uh, whatever it is per year, almost equals the amount that they show going to slaughter. What would that percentage be, I guess? Um, I honestly don't have an answer for that, and I don't want to make a mistake there. But we can say that if you were to research the number of foals born every year, you can find that that number is being sent. And again, you, you also pointed something out as well. We hear a lot of stories about the horses going to Mexico for slaughter, and we hear a lot of stories about them going to Asia for slaughter. They also go to Canada. This Is a, is it not fair to also say that this is a worldwide industry? The the slaughter, the the meat, if you will, the execution of horses for food for other cultures is a worldwide industry, and it's not looked upon as being something that that bad in other countries. How am I doing so far? That's pretty accurate, although I've talked to people in Britain. I lived in Australia. I worked in Australia for a while. I've been to Britain and stayed there, and it depends on the part of the country that you're in and who you speak to. There are some delicacies where they sell horse meat in that especially in France, they're okay eating that. However, in a lot of the British um, countries and Australia, there are a whole lot of people that are still against that. And that's been public campaigned in those countries as well as it is here. So um, the other things we see are it's not going always for human consumption. Horses go for consumption in other um, industries, such as food for other animals, um, food for zoos, um, but the other thing is they're also, their meat is added to things where they may not be listed on the menu. So that's a difficult one. But most of the horses that when they leave here go through the border um, via van to Canada or to Mexico. And uh, that's usually the way they go on to be slaughtered from the U.S. Uh, they do have a draft horse industry that goes more to Asia. But in general, the thoroughbreds tend to stay here or if they go to Asia, it's through one of the other means. Is there any real group here in America that's trying to stop that? Is there any legislation? Is there anything that's trying to keep this this railroad, if you will, to other countries for slaughter from happening on an illegal basis or an illicit basis? Yeah, actually, because they've shown some uh, footage of illegal butchering of horses in Florida, as a matter of fact, and the animal, I believe, Arms, has been one of the organizations, the, re the welfare organizations, to break that open and take them to trial and court, and some of them were jailed after being found. However, uh, I know that there's a Tonko Bar t uh, legislation that's trying to be passed to help for the long-term care as well as racing rules for thoroughbred racehorses. And um, there's a lot of groups that want a slaughter to come back to the United States so that we can better monitor it and that possibly the horses will be shipped shorter distances to um, undergo their slaughter process, mm -hmm. which theoretically, may be less stressful for them. But there's really no way to stop this, is there? When we look at the slaughter issue with thoroughbred racehorses, two, three-year-old animals, four years old, aren't we really basically helpless with the illicit trade? Unfortunately, it seems that way. I know that with there, I've worked with people who at the Canadian border try to say, hey, you have rules and policies through the CFIA um, that say you should not be having any horses with medications in their system going to slaughter for human consumption. Yet we know for a fact if we were let on those vans, we would see horses with tattoos that we can prove have been given medications that should not be allowed to be in food for human consumption. However, it appears that the Canadian border is looking the other way when it comes to those sort of things. Let's talk about money here for a minute because everything really comes down to money. If we were to look at the racing officials in the various industries around America, even in Canada as well, but let's stick to America, the racing officials themselves, the horsemen, 
And how about the other veterinarians as well, who pretty much do this in a wink and a nod with whatever happens? Who's the greediest in this bunch who simply doesn't give a damn? And as far as they're concerned, is just willing to go ahead and let the abuse, let the drugging, let the slaughtering continue because it puts bucks in their pocket? That's a tough question. I'd have to put it between the trainers and the owners. Uh, there's a lot of owners that have probably never even touched a horse, uh, but own racehorses. So I'd have to put them up there on the list. Some owners do it just as being involved in a sport or as in a business and uh, leave all the decisions and anything hands on to their trainers. So it's a tough one. If they're in, if the owner is in to horse racing, not for a hobby, not for the fun of going to the races and supporting their horses win or lose, then a lot of those people who are wanting to skimp on bills for care and appropriate treatment yet will, you know, spend some cash for whatever enhancement the horse needs to win the races, then I feel that they're at fault. But it really is a combination of all involved. The fact that Trainers and owners don't want to pay for veterinary examinations of their horses on the racetrack. They just want to pay you to do work, which they often tell you what to do rather than ask you as your veterinarian professional opinion for what should be done. Um, there's a lot of people at play there, but it's mostly, I would say, the trainers and owners. And the veterinarians figure if they don't do it, someone else will. I wanted to point out that in 2012... You were a witness in front of a U.S. House of Representatives subcommittee, a, a hearing on racing integrity. Doctor, I have to tell you something. When I know what I know about the thoroughbred racing industry, the way the animals are treated, and when I hear the words racing integrity, I almost have to find myself laughing, a very dark laugh, because I don't see a lot of integrity here. With the manner in which the animals are drugged and treated, is it not fair to say that from the time you testified in front of that House subcommittee in 2012, and here we are as we do this interview seven years later, that nothing has really changed, that there's no integrity here, that Santa Anita teaches us that this is still the same industry and the same greed, and the people involved are just throwing up their hands and going, ah, it's just a horse. What's the big deal? I'm not sure that that's what they're saying, even in uh, private quarters. However, I think that's how their actions are certainly coming across. I think a few things have changed since 2012, um, with third-party LASIKs being enacted and with the multiple violation um, rules as far as um, some of the mid-Atlantic tracks. But in general, uh, there is still a rampant drug problem, um, doping, performance enhancement, whatever you want to call it, which is just made for the horse to maximize their performance without any uh, attention to the long-term welfare of that individual horse. Then with a rampant drug problem, using your words and seeing as these are paramutuals that are all basically under the guise of the state, do we not then have to lop the states in here as well? Because they're not doing their job. They get their taxes, they get their revenue, they get a buck or a dime or whatever it is out of every single bet. And when it comes to the paramutual associations themselves at the states, they're turning their backs as well because, hey, if this industry gets shut down, look at all that money that's going out of our pocket right now. Should we not hold the states to the same sort of hard line that we hold the rest of these individuals? Absolutely. Um, there's no doubt about that, except for many of many of the issues come from having racinos, as we now have, where there's coupling of the racetracks with the casino money, and the casino money is bringing the states tons, and that's where the subsidies for the racing are coming from. Although the money is going to purses, it's not going to help the backside members, it's not going to help the barns and the horses, it's going to the purse money, and uh, to filling race cards. So... You know, that's the tough part, because I feel for some of the racing commissions who do have individuals on these commissions trying to make changes, and they're just getting stopped at every bridge they come to. The horsemen fight them on trying to make better 
choices for the horses. The state people fight them. Getting legislation passed is nearly impossible or takes a million years. And uh, anything that they do try to do or enact gets challenged in Commonwealth Court, at least here in Pennsylvania. And without the judges and the court systems knowing much about what's going on, a lot of times the challenger wins. Do we not need in many cases to have the actual video, the pictures, if you will, of the animals breaking down? I remember a long time ago when I saw Ruffian break down in the match race, and it was yeah. brutal to watch that brilliant, that brilliant animal drive itself into the ground for nothing more than greed. Its front legs just completely shattered. Do we not need to show more of these pictures, more of them graphically, the video themselves, show them to the people who go to the tracks, the media, if you will, and say, this is what you are helping to fund. Every single time you go out and slap a $2 bet down, you're putting money in the pockets of these people who will drive these animals in the ground, and they don't give a damn because it's all about profit. Should we not just get a little more graphic and get right in people's faces? I'm not sure that would make the right difference, to be honest. Really? Um, people like to avoid things like that. I don't know. If you spend any time on Facebook or Twitter, people will That's say, true. hey, if you post another picture of a dog that was abused or something like that, I'll stop following you. I don't need to see those things to understand what's going on. Um, I'm not saying that it won't make a difference for some people, although I don't think that's probably the right uh, action to take. I mean, there are a lot of activist groups that were standing outside Santa Anita and um, Saratoga doing picketing and showing images like this, and the outcry from the public was pretty much against um, showing the graphic images. I, I don't think it makes a, much of a difference, except for the people who are not at all um, familiar with what a catastrophic breakdown looks like. And even with that, it doesn't need to be carnage that you're showing them. It needs to be explained more than shown to them. People need explanations that they can understand I apologize than, for, and relate to. I apologize for becoming emotional because to me it's, it's, it's a very emotional issue because of what I've seen over the years. And, and I'm one of those people that gets <laughs> right out in people's faces. So if that's not the answer, what is the answer to make people understand what they are funding with their money and the second part of that question will be, is it not time to put the thoroughbred racing industry out of business to stop the slaughter entirely? Let's get to the first one here. What do we do with people? What do we show them? We be transparent. We give them, we need more promotion of everyday races. Don't cut out from the race when a horse goes down. Every place that offers replays and um, breezes in the mornings that they show live streaming, they always cut away from any injury that goes on and they focus on a different part of the race. Most people who watch races and there is a horse that has a catastrophic breakdown don't even know that it occurs unless they're in the flesh watching that race on, on site. So first things first is that we need to stop being so secretive and we need to show what racing really is and if we want to stand by and say that we don't believe that any horse death is okay then we need to own up to what's going on and we need to have an immediate response to what we're doing uh, to tell the public what we're doing about it and we need to show them rather than just saying it i mentioned the greyhound industry earlier they have finally at least here in florida put the greyhound industry under certainly all the abuse that those animals have undergone for decades and now we turn to thoroughbred racing these horses don't want to run every single day. They certainly don't want to be killed when they're four years of age or less. And I have said that it's time for the thoroughbred industry to go out of business, that quite frankly, we become a more humane society. I know that you don't believe in that entirely. You believe, as an article I read about, you said that there are angels and devils on both sides. So then if we don't put them out of business, which is going to be difficult in itself, then what? Because no one seems to be listening to regulation, and quite frankly, they'll spit in your eye and spit in my eye and say, we'll get away with it anyway. So uh, I, I, I guess I'm at, I'm, I kind of throw my hands up here. Why don't we put them out of business? 
Well, first of all, I don't think it's that easy. But um, right. and when you say I disagree with the statement that these horses don't want to run, I don't think every horse wants to run. Absolutely. But I do. I think some thoroughbreds want to run and enjoy racing and competing. Absolutely. I wouldn't have. I grew up anti-racing. I didn't have much experience. I grew up not too far away from Monmouth Park and um, always loving animals, always wanting to be a veterinarian. And I just from what I knew, thought racing was absolutely horrendous. And after my internship um, out of vet school, I went to work at, um, at Fair Hill in Maryland, and uh, I met a few horses, in they, and I actually adopted my first off-the-track thoroughbred, and some of these horses really, truly do love their job. I had some that I tried to retire and turn out and give the best life you could give to a horse if you were wanting to call it a natural life. And they would prefer to go train at the racetrack to, they would calm themselves. They would get into what we call the zone as for our human athletes when they go to race. So I don't think it's fair to say that not all of these horses want to race, but sure. Do they want to run every day with pre-existing injuries, with pain and drugs and being given shots in their jugular veins? Absolutely not. Um, and nor do they want to stand in stalls for 24 hours a day in a beaten up, backside racetrack barn stall that's 10 by 10 and falling apart so there's many things that need to happen differently and be changed if racing will survive if racing is to survive then I think it needs to be done differently that's the biggest thing I'm for I'm not for racing as it is right now I'm for uh, racing as it can be then what will you change I would make sure that our penalties for um, over-medicating, for cheating in any manner of the uh, way it's stated, are penalized very harshly. Um, the thing is, our slap on the wrist for, we had jockeys using buzzers that, you know, to zap horses to run faster and are caught on pictures. And they are getting six months, maybe, uh, that people have uh, testosterone positives. They're getting a month of a uh, of, uh, suspension. They just give their barns to other trainers to do the same thing in the meantime. I mean, I think all of that's ridiculous. You need to show people that you're serious. You need to punish them, send them off the racetrack a year, two years, 10 years, it's very similar to Australia and New Zealand, and uh, send a message to tell the other trainers, we're not, we're not screwing around. If this happens, if we find you doing something you're not supposed to do, you're out of here. No ifs, ands, or buts. And you know what? Also, your horse is going to be penalized, and your owners are going to be penalized, not just the trainers. You're not going to move that horse to another barn and have the same thing continue. We're going to penalize your horse, and we're going to penalize the owner. Maybe then the owners won't be using those trainers who want to uh, push the envelope. I fear, unfortunately, though, that no matter what you do, somebody is always going to find a way to cheat. We certainly have found that no matter what the sport is. And as I said, I covered sports for a lot of years. The steroid issues and the steroid era certainly taught us that if people want to cheat, they will continue to cheat no matter what. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but we need to address this again because it's one of those issues that I have been vehemently speaking out against for quite some time. I want to make it very clear again that Dr. Papp takes care of these horses with the Pennsylvania Racehorse Rehoming, Rehabilitation, and Rescue, P-A-R-R. Uh, doctor, if anybody wants to get a hold of you and perhaps wants to see about your organization taking care of their horses, how can they do that? Um, they can go to our website at paracehorse.org. And how many horses do you have now as we speak? We just recounted last night and uh, 21 on our location here in Harrisburg and six in other satellite locations. I applaud you for what you're doing. I hope you continue to speak out. I know that sometimes you become a thorn in the side of the people in the racing industry. I cannot tell you the, the amount of mail that I received in the days following the Kentucky Derby and before it too when I told people don't watch. Some of the hate mail I got from friends of mine in the industry who I've known for a long, long time, it was vile when they said, how dare I? I, I was going to say, I'm probably not the only one because you, you probably get your share as well, and I'm happy to do it on a regular basis. Uh, Dr. Papp, thank you so much again. Keep up the good work, and we're going to talk again real soon. Really, right. stay with it. Thank you so much me i really want to make a difference and anyone who's going to talk about the issues and get them out there that's the most important thing to me the you more people we reach the more time we'll be able to do you got a place right here anytime you want 
all the time. Thanks a lot, Doctor. We appreciate it. Thank you. I want to remind everybody again that the organization is the Pennsylvania Racehorse Rehoming, Rehabilitation, and Rescue, PARR. We have been flashing the website here on the video portion of what we do. Also, those of you listening in the audio platforms, you now have an opportunity to look for this on the website. Please take some time. Donate some money. Help the effort. It's a worthwhile effort. Worthwhile also for you to get a hold of us. Don't forget the ways to do it. There's so many ways. Email man in the arena at edberliner.com what do you think about this especially if you're a horse fan if you go out to the tracks what do you think about this and are you not concerned about the fact that you're helping to fund this industry man in the arena at edberliner.com social media it's at berliner speaks facebook twitter and instagram our podcast platforms we're heard on itunes google play uh, google play music tune in radio public spreaker cast box for android also Spotify. If you have any trouble getting any of the video or the audio, go to my website, edberliner.com. You'll find everything right there. Go ahead and download. But really, I want to hear from you, from the world, and how you feel about this specific item and this specific issue. Thank you so much for joining us again. And until we gather one more time, right here, Studio B for the man in the arena, I'm Ed Berliner. Rock on, true believers. True believers.